Your Excellency Alvaro Lario, President of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, distinguished members of your Governing Council, and to all gathered for this 46th session of the Governing Council of AFAD, I say thank you for giving me the opportunity to address your leadership and to do so in a way that reflects my respect for you for an, as an organization whose mantra so deeply resonates with me, investing in rural people. I grew up in urban areas, largely because my father and grandfather were both representatives of the capital city of Bridgetown. But I've always had, despite the hustle and bustle of city life being part of my DNA, a deep connection and admiration for people who grew up in rural settings, not to mention their ability to enjoy the bucolic nature of such a setting. For me, in so many ways, it is only when you get out of the rat race of urban settings, or what Bob Marley would call the concrete jungle, and connect with people who live in the country, who live in these open spaces, that sometimes you see the best of what we can offer as human beings, largely because that sense of space also amplifies the space in our heads so much to be able to have a different perspective and to be able to dream. I say all of this not to be overly romantic. In truth, I see it as an utterly pragmatic statement to make that if we wanted to achieve the best for our planet and the best for humankind, then we must invest in all of our people, but especially rural people who very often are not given the chances largely because of their separation through distance. I say this with complete conviction because I have the good fortune also to be the leader of a country and of a political party whose core values are built on distributed equitable investment across our nation. In my own country, the cost of a short bus ride on public transport in the urban corridor is the same cost as a cross-country bus ride from one rural village to another. The same $3.50 Barbados dollars, or to convert it, $1.75 US dollars. When you come to our country, yes, this is an open invitation for all of you to come, and you'll see it for yourself. You will see that as a people, we fundamentally believe that there should be no penalty to being born into a rural family. We believe that all should be done to bring services to people. And whether it is access to power, to water, to schools, to transportation, to health centers, to recreation areas, we believe that there should be no reduction in access or quality of life services just because you live in a rural area. When you do come to Barbados and venture to see our beautiful rural areas, you will see similar to rural people all over the world, rural Barbadians grow, care and cook what they eat. Rural people don't need cutesy branding like slow food or term technical terminology like food security. That's their life. That's what they've known all their lives, growing, caring, and cooking their food. That's how they've lived. So colleagues, despite whatever physical distance and differences that separate our rural regions from cities, to quote the American novelist and environmental activist Wendell Berry, the earth is what we all have in common. That is to say that people in rural villages and communities cannot escape the multiple crises facing our planet today. Indeed, it is the rural people of the planet who are feeling the full impact of crises for which they have no responsibility and for which they have little protection. The war, the pandemic, the climate crisis, the energy costs, the coral reef depletion, the blockages of ships coming out of harbors and going into harbors disrupting supply chains, the inflation, the recession, they've all resulted in fisher folk with less fuel to fish, pastoralists with less feed and water to tend animals, and farmers with less seeds and fertilizers to grow food. When you combine all these factors, you get the reality of a world that is experiencing an unprecedented food crisis. A truly staggering statistic from the United Nations reports that more people are hungry today than were hungry in 2015 when the Sustainable Development Goals were first introduced. I want to repeat myself, that more people are hungry today than in 2015 when the Sustainable Development Goals to which all of us have committed were first introduced. The question is then, how on earth can we possibly address the complex challenges we have with climate, with biodiversity, 
with rising sea levels, with antimicrobial resistance, and with the infodemic when we can't even figure out how to equitably distribute food and resources so that everyone on this, our planet, can eat. Yes, my friends, the world needs change. The world needs reform. The world needs a global financial system to be fit for purpose for all and to provide solutions that will address vulnerable countries' immediate fiscal concerns while also increasing their resilience to shocks. The world needs a system that addresses the perennial issue of poor countries' ability to access resources at speed and scale required to address the climate crisis, relieve financial stress, enable economic development, and increase citizen safety. But the world also needs to address the condition of poor people, as 70% of the poor people live in middle-income countries. And if we deny middle-income countries access to concessional funds, especially knowing their vulnerability to the climate crisis, to the pandemics, and to so many other things, then we have not met the objective of stopping poor people from being poor. The reality, my friends, is that agricultural growth is two to four times more successful than other sectors at decreasing poverty, at stopping people from literally being poor. To avoid recurring food crises and to end hunger and end poverty, countries must have the fiscal space to invest in agriculture and the food systems at speed and scale, as well as to ensure long-term rural development. Countries must have access to the technology Countries must have access to the public education as to how to grow their food without using the traditional pesticides that may well boost their resistance to antimicrobials and their ability, therefore, to fight infection when they most need to be protected. Every region, of course, has its own peculiarities and challenges. In our region, the Caribbean, which largely comprises of small island developing states, we're challenged with a high dependence on food imports as domestic food production is severely constrained not just by fragile natural environments or small land masses or limited supplies of water, but terms of trade policy that make it uncompetitive for our farmers to continue to farm all year round. This large dependence on imported food, most of which is highly processed and pasteurized, has resulted in a more insidious but no less challenging problem for all of us nutrition and non-communicable disease crisis. This is why we don't just speak only of food security, but we speak of food and nutrition security. My friends, we support the Global Action Program on Food Security and Nutrition in Small Island Developing States. This calls for an increase in domestic farming, the empowerment of smallholder farmers and small-scale food producers, with a focus on women and young people, as a centerpiece for the development of sustainable, resilient, nutrition-sensitive value chains. In Barbados, we have significantly increased the investment and focus on the agricultural industry and on nutrition and food security. At the micro level, we have sought to scale up the support and knowledge of domestic and small farmers. We continue to do so particularly with practices, we hope, that will allow them to move away from those that are harmful to boosting um, their capacity to, to, to fight off the superbugs. At the macro level, fully cognizant of the challenges of our small land mass, we have leveraged our strong ties with our Caribbean neighbors in Guyana and are working on the establishment of a Barbados-Guyana food terminal as a public-private partnership. Guyana has an abundant supply of land and water. Barbados is a regional hub for air and maritime travel. We will therefore build in Barbados a multipurpose facility that will house 45 containers, cold storage and packaging and processing plants, and a large water reservoir. Fresh produce that we import will not only enhance our country's food and nutrition security, not only be added to our farmers' output, but it will also ensure that we can process and export food that will make a significant reduction to the earning of foreign exchange and to keeping the price of food down within the domestic markets. Extraordinary circumstances necessitate extraordinary interventions. And that is why I'm so pleased to be speaking to you, my friends, today. Understanding that it is the launch of IFAD's 13th replenishment, this is a moment for the world's governments and financial agencies to recognize that we need to invest right now 
in securing food and nutrition for citizens across the planet, especially poor people, to invest in smallholder agriculture, to invest in diversified local production and food systems transformation, to invest in ending the world's hunger and nutrition crisis. In the words of Bob Marley, who you know I love to quote, them belly full, but we're hungry. A hungry mob is an angry mob. If the world can find money for endless wars, and money to send robots to Mars, and money to solve male baldness, then surely, my friends, we can find the will and money to adapt, mitigate, and stop the climate crisis. The will and money to be able to ensure that food insecurity is something for the history books. Surely, we can find, therefore, the will and money to prioritize helping our farmers so that they can help us stop this food insecurity, that they can build a reasonable living for their families, and that they ultimately, in the investment in sustainable food and agriculture, will help us close the circle so that we nourish the people of our planet, not only our home, and we do so with speed. I thank you.